had a lot of emails from people asking how to sharpen my spoon blades. Um, I think it's time to make a video on it. I've actually had four goes from doing this and they, they haven't gone well. But Alex is along, uh, he's doing a cooks and carving workshop over here this weekend. Uh, so we're going to have a, another go at filming it. So this blade has got a curve on it. So obviously it's got a curve going this way, but the bevel is also curved in this plane, which throws out the first difficulty with sharpening it. Uh, it's very difficult to sharpen a blade which is curving like that. If you try to hit it with a water stone or a diamond stone, anything hard, it's very difficult to find where the edge is at any one point because it's curved. And also, it's not just you've got to find this and then work, you've got to work round in the other plane. So trying to hit the edge perfectly round here is very difficult. So my solution to that is not to, not to do it. It's to stay away from the outside as much as possible. I've put a lot of effort in getting this profile right. And for a large, to a large extent, you can just leave that alone. However, what I have done is I've put a lot of effort into hollowing the inside. So we've got these two characteristic tram lines. Uh, which make it very easy to sharpen um, because if you put the dowel across it it will automatically sit across this and the tool will follow the dowel so if I put the tool down put the dowel on a press it will just hold it if I move the dowel the tool will follow it so you'll, if you're working across these two tram lines you'll hit the edge every time so it just makes it so much easier to sharpen so the sharpening is basically done from the inside to the outside, large, as much as possible, leave alone, because it's much more difficult to do. So that's quite different than most of the opinions I've heard from other tool makers and other videos I've seen online, that they always tell you to leave the inside bevel alone and only sharpen the outside, but you're telling us to do the opposite. Uh, yes, 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 no, that's true, but then my, my edge geometry is different to other blades. Uh, we've got this convex bevel on the outside, which is say difficult to hit, and the inside is easy to hit, so you're just doing the easiest thing. If you look at a Mora knife, um, Mora spoon knife, it's, it's curved on the inside, so I can actually, if I put a dowel on and rock it, there's a lot of places it sits and feels like I'm on the edge, so I could be rubbing away on the inside and not actually hitting the edge, right. but it's more difficult to know the hitting the edge. I can rock it up until I hit the edge, but I might then be rounding it. But then, that's the whole point, is that this my blade's different from most other blades out there, so it's a different sort of technique right. we're talking about. Yeah, now when I started off uh, making spoon blades, I did follow the standard sort of geometry which most blades follow this. Um, and you can get a blade very sharp, and I'd send blades out to people, or at a show I'd sell a blade, and it cut very well. Uh, but they'd come back a year later, and quite often they'd absolutely destroyed the geometry because they'd rounded this inside and they'd round the inside and you'd end up with an edge which was like this. Mm. And it's very difficult to recover from that. So that's one of the reasons I came up with this geometry is because people were having difficulty sharpening. Um, and now people buy, buy blades from me and I'll see them a year later and they'll be just as sharp as when they got them. Um, which, is, which is great because it's, I say, sharpening. It's all very well sending someone out a sharp blade but if they can't maintain it, it's just going to go downhill. Okay, so coming to actually sharpen the blade, I think the first thing is to, to see how blunt it is. to give you an idea of the degree of sharpening you want to do. Um, so I'm going to cut, uh, cut with this one here, and just see what sort of cut it will do. Uh, and you can see, I mean, that's obviously cutting very well. If it was cutting this well, all I would probably do is strop, because there's no, I can see that there's no track lines, um, track lines on it, it's not, not shattering, um, there's not really much that needs to be done. So that, in that case, it will just need dropping. But, assuming that I damaged it, and I hate to do this, but uh, it doesn't take a lot to, to don't really like doing that, but otherwise, well, how do you blunt in a blade here? At this point, when I cut, mm, I've got one. if you're lucky, you can see where it is, but the wood is actually more sensitive, and you can see track lines and see scratch lines running along here. And what I find really useful is to make a cut, line it up with the track lines, and then just mark the inside of the blade with a sharpie or whatever where it needs doing. So I know that I need to do work on this area. So that's something I'll concentrate on. So when you've got a ding like that, which isn't major, but there is a ding, we need to remove a certain 
decent amount of steel, but not a huge amount. I do these in twenties normally, so I have these pre-cut. But this is just a sheet of paper, knife. which has been cut in half and then cut into strips. What I do is I wrap it round, I wet it, and I will run away from the edge. A bit of rotation is nice, and just work on the area. I can see the um, the um, sharpie mark where I marked it, so I know which bit to work on. And it won't take very long because the effective bevels you're working on are only a couple of millimetres wide, so it's not a lot of steel mm. we're trying to remove. What I'll do next is uh, 1200 grit is relatively coarse, and I can just about feel when a burr's appeared, and that means I've definitely hit the edge, uh, which isn't quite yet, so I'll do a little bit more. Something I've noticed is uh, you're holding the knife different than I would, I'm right handed. All oh, right. Yes, that's true. Yes, yeah. Because because I do this um, professionally, most of my time is spent doing right-handed blades. So as a left-hander, you're seeing a left-hander sharpen a right-handed blade, um, which is perhaps a bit easier because I'm pulling away. If I'm doing a left-handed blade, which I'll show you, different one, but it's the same idea. Left-handed blade, like this. Um, what you can't do is push. I still want to work away so the edge is this side. So if I push away from the edge, that won't work as well because you can get the paper wrinkling up because you're pushing. You need to hold the paper in tension. So you need to be pulling away from, you need to be working. You still got to work away from the edge, but you want the paper in tension. So if you have a way around that, it's not quite as easy. But if you hold it this way, then you can work away from the edge mm. and hold the paper in tension. So at this stage, I have now sharpened this enough that I can feel a slight burr mm. on, uh, on the area which I'm trying to, trying to get rid of the nick in it. So what okay. I want to do now is wipe that burr off because it's not going to cut very well. Um, at this stage, rather than trying to uh, keep it dead flat, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be stropping. Uh, and there's a little bit of give in, in uh, this is just some suede glue to MDF. Um, and that's got a little bit of give, which makes it much easier to find the edge because it will it will wrap round and follow the edge, so you're not it's not all or nothing whether you've hit or not. To hit. Okay. Um, I'm going to cheat now. It's much better to have two strops uh, if you're doing grey and white, which are the two compounds. It's much better to have two separate strops, but I haven't. And rather than cut this in half, I've labelled it G W and I won't mess up. So grey compound is the coarser one, uh, and I'll just rub this on. I don't want to put too much on, rub it on like a crayon and then I'll run away from the edge and you can see a black line appearing which is steel which has been cut so run away from the edge, quite a lot of down pressure and with practice you'll feel a point where you're hitting the edge mm -hmm. but you don't want to roll around the edge, you're just aiming to just and all you're trying to do is remove the burr, you're not going to do anything more than that so that's now and this isn't a brilliant edge, but it's good enough that if you try it, if I cut now, I should see that I'm not getting any tram lines. So if you're happy with that, go on to the next stage. There's no point going on to the final stage, getting a perfect edge, try it, then find you've got to go back through the grip. So try it at this stage. If you've removed, okay. if you've got rid of any edge damage, then, um, then you're ready to move on to the next grade. Yes, so the next stage of sharpening is going to be to take the scratch marks out. So we've got 1,200, we're going to take that up to uh, 3,000. Uh, it does sound like a big jump. However, uh, because the bevels are so thin, the actual amount of metal we've got to move is small, and you can take these huge jumps. Uh, some people will go 1,200, about 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, all the way through, but I've found I can make this jump to 3,000. Which is great because I say the less time you spend sharpening, the better, really. So, piece of 3000 grit paper. And again, I will wet, I'll wet this just to make it cut a little bit easier. Wet the blade. And I will uh, take out the 1200 grit scratches, which really shouldn't take very long. I try and slow down. I mean, normally I have a stack of 20 of these, so I try and get through it quicker. So one of the troubles of the past videos I made is I've done everything at full speed and it's just a blur really, right. so I'll try and slow down. But, but also I wanted to show that it can be done quickly, so it's a balance I suppose. But so I'm working, 
gate, keep the paper in tension away from the edge. And a bit of rotation so you're not using the same bit of sandpaper all the time. And that'll do it. That's all it needs. Got to a stage where um, we've got 3,000 grit scratches, but we've got the grey scratches on the outside. Laid all the scratches from the grey compound, so I will put some white compound on the other side. So, so yeah, thin layer like this, and then I'll work through this. So, push it down, locate to the edge, and then this isn't too easy to do, I have to say, but you can do it. Sometimes, when I started off, I'd do the sort of the flatter section like this, and then I'd do the curved section. So I'd do it in two stages. So that's what. Um, that's polished the outside, so the outside is finished as far as I'm concerned. The inside is still left at 3,000 grit, um, which is good, but we can do better than that. So doing this doesn't take any time. And a thin layer, if you put too much on, even if it's onto clean wood, it's still going to be, you're just going to be sharpening on a big lump of wax rather right. than the abrasive wood. So all I do now is exactly the same, the same thing, is run away from the edge polish up the inside and I say this is so easy because it naturally will want to sit it's very hard if you want to you could tip it up and round the edge but that's not the idea I mean it'll just naturally want to sit right. between these two trap lines so it lends itself to the process yes that's why I, that's why I came up with the, uh, with the idea really just to make it easier if you want to be really good you could argue you've got a slight you could do a tiny couple of wipes the other way so if there was a bird you just work back and forwards but, uh, but that's all it needs and uh, that should be nice and sharp now. So that's really all you need to do is sharp I mean, it can be you know, very quick Well, I'd like to thank everybody who's supporting my work. I've, I've had so many questions about sharpening these tools and it seems sensible to do a video. Uh, hopefully it's been helpful and we should be doing some more. Okay, thank you.